All right, with it being 631, I call the Francis Howell School District Board of Education meeting to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We're going to start our meeting uh, this evening with a moment of silence. Um, please join me in a moment of silence for George Haynes, an ELA, ELA teacher at Warren Elementary. Thank you. Definitely a loss to our Francis Hall community. Board, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda as submitted. So moved. Second. Motion made by Mrs. Walker, seconded by Mr. Lang. All of those in favor? Aye. 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 All of those opposed? Motion carries. First on our agenda this evening uh, is recognitions, and I'd like to turn that over to Dr. Hendricks Harris. We're going to turn it over to, I believe, Mary LePac, who is going to uh, talk to us about a very prestigious award. Actually, I'm going to to uh, pass it over to David Luther to start. Okay, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the Francis House School District Board of Education and to uh, Superintendent Hendricks uh, Harris for allowing us a few minutes to, uh, to recognize someone that uh, we hold in very high esteem. So I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, the Professional of the Year Award and then uh, Kelly Wachel, APR, is our president. She's over at Kansas City Public Schools and you know Mary LaPac from Wentzville. She's our Eastern Director. We're all three gonna share a little bit uh, about, uh, about Matt and then uh, hopefully Matt will be given a little opportunity to, to speak. I can't imagine he would not be. Um, he'll, he'll grab it anyway. So uh, the Professional of the Year is our most prestigious award. Um, typically, we would have given this award at the uh, spring conference, but as you know, we canceled that. And so, a little bit about the award, uh, the professional leader, uh, that is a person who is going to be very strategically minded, they're organized, ability to develop and implement high-level communication practices. They're often uh, a strategic advisor to their uh, administrative team, to the board, and uh, to principals throughout the district. Um, so Matt has those skills and many, many others. I'm going to, do it to uh, turn it over to Kelly Wachel to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that we learned about Matt from the letters of nomination. Great, thank you, David. Um, this is what was said about Matt in his nomination form. Matt Dykeman is a true leader, hardworking and dedicated to the mission, vision, and values of his organization, recognizing the strengths of his staff, inviting and encouraging team collaboration, and coaching through challenges while effectively managing messaging across multiple channels to effectively reach students, parents, staff, and community members. Matt is well-respected in MOSPRA and a K-12 education leader because he is masterful at sharing everything from student and staff success, new curricular activities, the sometimes complicated financial framework of public education, school and district needs, and essential facts related to crisis situations. So proud of you, Matt. A former superintendent wrote, Matt quickly became a trusted coworker and friend. Even when he told me things I didn't want to hear, he was trying to help the district and me. Dr. Mary Hendricks Harris wrote, Matt has been a key leader as we both developed and rolled out our strategic plan. He has ensured every step of our process and progress are transparent. 
Mary, do you want to add anything else? I mean, you had to work with this guy for a little while. <laughs> I did, I did. Uh, it was a fantastic five years, actually. I learned so much for, from him. He's very strategic and uh, he took the time to really uh, walk me through the processes and I can't thank him enough for what I learned in those five years. He was a mentor then and he's been a mentor since he left and I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, before Matt gets an opportunity to speak, I just want to say thank you to Matt for all he's done. This is a very prestigious award, and especially when it's presented by your colleagues, I know how much it means. Uh, I, I personally appreciate all the work and the hours Matt has put in on behalf of our district and truly has made our communications better. One of the things I appreciate about Matt is just his vision as we push to, to get to the next place in Francis Hall. So. Matt and I, we've been through a lot, and his work has always been clutch and above the expect our high expectations here in Francis Hall. So congratulations, Matt. Sorry we couldn't have done this in person. <laughs> well, um, thank you all. It's a great honor, and it's, it's always wonderful to be recognized by your, by your peers. Um, I'm truly humbled, and, and you know that's saying something. Um, MOSPRA is a, an important organization for school communicators across our state, and the two biggest benefits are clearly relationships and resources. Um, the, the past several months have been a, a great reminder about the importance of effective school communications and, and our role in that process. And, and we're all more effective in those efforts because of MOSPRA. Uh, I've been lucky enough to have some great mentors along the way, pros like David Luther and Cindy Gibson to help me. And I've, I've tried to pay that forward, serving as a, as a mentor to some of the younger members. Uh, now, unfortunately, that's all of the members. Um, so it's been very rewarding to see some of the rookies like Mary LePac turn into excellent, you know, veterans in their own right. So uh, thanks again. I really appreciate it and uh, vote on June 2nd. <laughs> thanks again uh, for letting us uh, spend a little bit of time. Uh, saying kind words about Matt. He is not only one of the very best professionals that we work with, but he is also one of the funniest people in our association. So we enjoy his company and we wish him well as he uh, retires and uh, continues working in, uh, in the field in some form or fashion. Thank you all. Congratulations. Congratulations, Thanks. Matt. Thank you, Jen. Okay, respectfully, I am going to leave your board meeting. Uh, so uh, thank you again for having us on and uh, Matt, we'll talk to you soon. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me now? I was muted. Yep, thank you. Hey, Matt, congratulations. Uh, so excited to have you part of the team and uh, what a great honor as as you retire into your next adventure so congratulations thank you Renee. all right next on our agenda is patron comments um, the board of education welcomes comments from the community so comments were submitted uh, prior to tonight's virtual meeting since this is a little bit different format a reminder is that all comments will be addressed by the appropriate staff member after the meeting and I'll need, now read the comments that have been submitted. So we have three patron comments. Uh, the first is from Dana Schultz. Um, it reads, we now know that children don't easily get COVID-19, nor do they easily transmit COVID-19. In the light of these facts, please completely open up school in the fall. Let us know as soon as possible what the plans are for September. Myself and many of my friends who parent children in Francis Howell need to look to the future. I must make a decision as to send my children back to school or to pull them out to homeschool. We appreciate our fantastic schools. We need our normal. Our children need their normal. Thank you for your consideration, D. 
initial D Schultz. The next one is from Steve Burke. Um, it reads, new location for proposed North High School. What are you doing for a buffer zone? How are you going to abide to the city's noise level? How are you going to abide to the city's light pollution laws due to the school butting up to McClay Valley subdivision? The third one is from Amy Hunt. It reads, what will the reopening policies for the 2020-2021 school year? What is expected for students, teachers, parents, etc., in order to send our kids back to school? And are they in the best interest of our students and teachers? So those patron comments were submitted today or prior to our meeting today. Next on our agenda is typically uh, the opportunity for FHEA to comment. Uh, the president, Anita Kuhner, has submitted some information and I will read that now. Good evening, President Cope, Board of Education, Dr. Hendricks Harris, and Executive Cabinet. FHEA is pleased that we are being asked to collaborate on committees and look forward to helping make plans that protect both students and staff. However, we have brought up some things that we feel are unsafe for our teachers that were not addressed in the end of the year plans. The standard line is we are following the Department of Health guidelines, but perhaps these things did not have to be done at this time or in this way. In some elementary schools, but not all, teachers must go to the office and get the permanent files for students that they will have next school year so that they could put their names on those files. That means that 60, maybe 70 people had to walk into the office to get the files, bring them back to their classroom, put their names on each file, then bring these files back and put them in the file cabinet. This seems unreasonable because everything touched by students is sitting for 14 days, but 60 people going through filing cabinets is okay. There is something that should have been done, but this is something that should have been done by one person. There would have been much less risk. Some buildings figured this out. A teacher's safety should not depend on whether their principal believes this is a real threat or not. Some principals allowed people that were concerned about their health or the health of their families to come in the week prior. Some did not. We believe that principals need to be in communication about the things that are left up to buildings just to make sure that the most safe practices are being used across the district. Also, the re-entry team made up of FHEA teachers from all levels believe that teachers would complete closing rooms and stay home to complete any work or PD that could be done virtually. Some principals communicated their plans this way, but others were expecting teachers to stay all three workdays. We believe that the district could have made this expectation clear from the beginning instead of stressing teachers out because principals were enforcing different expectations. It is interesting to me that we have sent teachers back and we have parents coming in this week, yet the Board of Education meeting is on Zoom. I'm not in disagreement with the meeting being on Zoom. I also want all educators and families safe. Um, and that was all the comments that we had submitted for this evening's meeting. Next on our agenda is the consent agenda. Board, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented for May 21st, 2020. So moved. Second. Motion made by Mr. Lang, seconded Second. by Mrs. Walker. All of those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries.
All right, next on our agenda under academics, we have our academic high target. We're going to have a presentation by Dr. Lammers and Dr. Garland as an update to the revisions to the 2019-2020 summer school. I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. I'm just waiting for the um, presentation to queue up. Um, Members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to give you some an update on um, the status of, of where things are going with summer school for this year. Uh, previously, um, in, a, in an earlier meeting, uh, you had seen a um, presentation on what we were going to do for summer school for this year, and that was before COVID. Um, and the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic has forced some changes to our summer program offerings. Um, and we do still intend to offer uh, virtual and other required programs this summer. Um, we're gonna, tonight we're going to give you an update on where things stand with elementary, middle school, and high school. And first will be elementary. And uh, if we go to the next slide, that will be Dr. Garland. Thank you, Dr. Lammers. Good evening. So I'll just take a couple minutes just to review um, the revisions to um, what we had previously planned. Um, as you can see from looking at the slide, we still intend to offer the elementary summer success program, which is our remedial program. Um, we will offer it virtually from June, 30, June 3rd through June 30th. Um, the new format will be, we will offer two sessions, um, Monday through Friday. The sessions will be from 8.30 a.m to 10 a.m. and then 10.30 a.m. to noon. And those will be for different students. So students will be enrolled in one session. So the sessions will be approximately 90 minutes with two 10 minute breaks built in for the students. Um, the um, instruction will be solely focused on reading. Um, and we will be using some programs that we already have in district that teachers will be trained on if they're not already trained on the program. Um, we are planning to still offer our kindergarten summer success program in person. Many of our schools that had planned for either June or early July programs have moved their dates to mid to end of July, mid August dates. So the plan as of right now would be to still um, have those programs and have them in person as we feel that that is so beneficial for our kindergarten students as they transition into our schools. Um, and as required, um, we will have the extended school year and that will be in person um, for two weeks, July 13th through the 31st. Um, that will be housed at Westwood. Um, Dr. Kim Turner and Dr. Vanderpool will, are kind of um, working through the arrangements of that. Um, it'll be similar program to, to similar enrollment, excuse me, to what we had last year. Um, some of the major changes, kids will not be switching classes as they have in the past. They'll stay in the same location. Um, it's a half day program and it will be five days a week. Um, as you know, um, we had spent a lot of time planning um, enrichment and we had a pretty robust enrollment. So we're disappointed that we have to cut that. But I am pleased to say that as of today, we do have approximately 475 students still enrolled in our virtual programming for the elementary summer success. So that's, that's we're, we're very excited that we still have that many students enrolled. We uh, go to the next slide. So at the middle school level, we do plan to continue to offer middle school summer success. That is going to be some um, uh, remediation, remedial services for uh, reading and, and math. Uh, that's still going to be offered June 3rd through uh, June 30th using uh, platforms that we already um, use that, uh, with the Read 180. And um, we're going to be using some IXL. Um, which is a, a, a program that's used pretty extensively in the district for the math services. And we will still um, have the extended school year services, which will be at Hollenbeck Middle School in July. 
um, we did. Uh, this was going to be an exciting year with the in-person enrichment programs, uh, which uh, we're not going to be doing the in-person programs this summer. So we did have to cut the app camp, the Shark Tank camp, the babysitting certification, STEM, biomed, and theater. Uh, but the good thing is we have done some work in writing curriculum for those programs and um, we will be in a much better position to offer those the following summer. Uh, if we advance to the next slide, please. And at the high school level, we will still offer credit recovery um, using our Admentum software or our courseware. Uh, we will also still offer credit advancement using Admentum courseware. Um, students will still be able to participate in up to two classes in the early college program, which will also be virtual through St. Charles Community College. And um, extended school year services will be um, offered in person at North High also in July. And at the high school level, we had to cut the early warning system summer success course, the Max Scholars Summer Institute, AP Prep Camp, College Explo Camp, and the Military Career Camps because those were, um, we were not able to offer those in a virtual environment. Uh, yeah. Um, so what this meant for the budget situation for summer school, the original uh, projected revenue was going to be just over $1.5 million. Uh, projected expenses were right in that same line. We were projecting to run a little bit of a surplus of $25,000. With these new uh, modifications, the projected revenue um, is $440,000, so a 72% cut. We do have some expenses that were built into the summer program. Um, that um, have to be there. Um, so the um, summer program summer budget um, has historically paid for Math 180 textbooks that are used during the regular school year. And also the summer budget pays for summer um, extended school year, which we have to run. So even with the cuts, we still have to run these other two programs. And so that put us in a position where um, uh, we're projecting to run a deficit of $64,000. We also know that the CARES Act can be used to cover some of those programming needs. Um, funding levels through the CARES Act aren't 100% yet. We also know that if there are, um, if we have higher enrollment than we anticipated, our projected revenue will be higher. And we are seeing um, higher enrollment than anticipated. Like we, we had already reached the um, number of health uh, courses that we were planning to offer for the summer. We, we had kind of capped out and now we are in a position where we have more people and instead of waitlisting, we're going to be able, to, we've made some modifications to allow those students in. So at the high school level for credit advancement, we're going to have more students in. Um, so the revenue could be higher than what the projections were. Um, staffing implications on this, the original plan, we were going to have 358 staff members involved in the summer program. And due to the cuts that we had to make uh, due to the pandemic, um, it's a 63% cut in our position. So we will have 131 staff members uh, working summer school this summer. Uh, there were four administrator positions that were cut. Um, administrator salaries were cut and the administrators who stayed on will, are also going to be teaching courses. We can go to the next slide. All right, uh, with that, uh, we open it up to any questions from members of the board for Dr. Garland and for myself. Thank you very much for the presentation. Board, do you have any questions? Mrs. Lang? Nope, just said thank you. Oh, you were on mute, so I couldn't tell for sure. Um, I want to thank you both for the presentation. You know, um, we're in unprecedented times. And so I appreciate the thoughtfulness that has gone into um, where we need to be with these programs, keeping our students in mind first and foremost. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I, you know what, actually, real quick, um, I did have one more question. Are you, I know that you're, you said that enrollment is up in some areas a little higher than you expected. Are you receiving any feedback uh, from students and parents uh, about how we're moving forward with summer school? 
Um, I haven't really received a lot of feedback yet. We did have some students that did not, um, who, who were not previously enrolled, who are now enrolled. Um, at the elementary level, we, um, we, we do enrollment on a tiered system. So our most needy students get, invita in, get invited first. And then as we fill spots, it, it's a tiered system. And so we are picking up some kids who were not registered before, which is a good thing. Um, one obstacle that we've had to overcome, um, but Dr. Vanderpool was quick to help us problem solve, is previously, if you were enrolled in Vacation Station, you could attend summer school and then go to Vacation Station. Well, with summer school being virtual now, parents were wondering, can my student participate virtually while they're at Vacation Station? And that was not something that we had thought through. So he was working with the vacation station team and we have been able to figure that out for those students as well. Great, thank you very much. All right, board, uh, next on our agenda is human resources. I would entertain a motion to reallocate the stipend for elementary department chairs and approve the 2020-2021 extra duty schedule as presented. So moved. Second. Okay. Motion made by Mr. Lang, seconded by Mrs. Walker. Mrs. Simpkins. Thank you, Mrs. Cope. Administration is recommending uh, that our extra duty stipends remain the same for next school year as they are set for this year. Um, as we are unsure of what revenue and what our budget needs will be next year, we feel like this is the most responsible recommendation to make with you to you. With that said, um, I do want to thank the committee, the elementary department chair committee who met earlier this year to discuss some procedures um, and changes for our elementary department chairs. Uh, they have a meeting once a year uh, where they come in for a day and meet with the building principals to plan for the next school year. And oftentimes that is done during that week where all of our teachers are back for professional development or work days and the buildings provide that $150 stipend for that day. We are asking that we just reallocate that money to the full stipend that they receive as a department chair, and that meeting will be held prior to that first week um, so that teachers are able, department chairs are able to fully utilize that week to prepare for students. Thank you, Mrs. Simpkins. Board, any questions? Mrs. Walker? Um, so how will all of this work in the fall if there are no sports? I mean, I know that's a ways out right now, but I'm just, you know, it's a consideration that I don't want anybody, I, I'm just curious, how is that going to work? So the HR department does have a task force that we will be convening with some administrators uh, with FHEA and FISPA as we work for that reentry. And that's one of the things I think we'll need to problem solve around. Um, most of our extra duty stipends would probably be able to continue for department chairs or some of those, those uh, clubs that can social distance well. Um, if we were to get some guidance from uh, the county health department that would say a sport is deemed unsafe, I think we'll have to have some conversation around whether or not we continue to move that stipend forward. Um, and we'll have some conversation and make those recommendations through that task force. Board, any other questions? Okay. All of those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Board, I'll entertain a motion to approve one additional certified position at Central Elementary as presented. So moved. Second. Motion made by Mr. Lang, seconded by Mrs. Stiglich. Mrs. Simpkins? So Central Elementary is one of our Title I schools and they receive funds through that program. Each year we are required to do a comparability study and the overall class sizes for Central Elementary should be lower than all other average class sizes in elementary buildings. And we are not in compliance with that moving forward into next year. So we are recommending adding one classroom teacher to Central Elementary. The position will be paid for with Title I funds. 
Um, and that will allow us to be in compliance as we move forward into the comparability study for the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you, Ms. Simpkins. Board, any questions, comments, concerns? All right, all of those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Board, I'll entertain a motion to approve the reallocation of FTE for behavioral support specialist positions as presented. So moved. Second. Motion made by Mrs. Walker, second by Mr. Hain. Mrs. Simpkins. Thank you. We are asking the board's permission to reallocate four positions. Uh, we will be adding a behavior support specialist, one at each high school and one at Bardwell Middle School. Um, to just support the social emotional needs of our students. Those four positions will come from be, uh, paraprofessional positions that will be vacated through attrition. Uh, the reason we are asking for your approval is the behavior support specialist position is at a higher pay. So the increase in cost will come at about $6,000 uh, in regards to salary. They are all full-time positions, so there's no additional benefits that will be added to these positions as the para positions also received benefits. Uh, but we think that this will be a good move in meeting the needs of our students moving forward. Thank you, Mrs. Simpkins. Board, any questions, comments, concerns? Mrs. Stiglitz. Mrs. Simpkins, can you explain to me why Barnwell is the only middle school that was chosen to have this? Do they not already have a behavioral specialist? I think there are some increased needs at Barnwell, and our middle schools do have some drop-in services available at this time, but it is a, an opportunity for us to see if these positions will be helpful and supportive. And then as we move forward, we may be moving, uh, moving some additional FTE to allow this position to be at each high school in the future, or sorry, each okay. middle school in the future. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Any other questions, comments, concerns? All right, all of those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Moving into the financial section of our agenda, board, I'll entertain a motion to approve the purchases over $7,500 as presented. So moved. Second. Motion made by Mrs. Lang, seconded by Mr. Hain. Mr. Supple, anything to add? Uh, no, thank you, Mrs. Cope. Be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Or do we have any questions? All right, all of those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Board, I'll entertain a motion to approve the monthly financial report for April 2020 as presented. So, so moved. moved. Second. Second. Motion made by Mrs. Stiglitz, seconded by Mrs. Walker. Mr. Supple? Thank you, Mrs. Cope. Uh, in addition to the information that was shared in uh, April's memo, uh, I would provide an update to the board about information that just came out uh, this week. On Wednesday, the governor in what in my uh, uh, long career uh, was an unprecedented move, uh, convened a conference call of superintendents uh, across the state of Missouri uh, in order to let us know that while the message prior uh, may have been uh, that schools were in a pretty good position, particularly after the approval of a budget, which uh, included full funding for the formula, that he anticipated that there was still a significant budget hole that would need to be closed, and that while we might consider that we're in good shape, we were not in good shape. He intends to have another call um, in the next week or so, and we'll provide more specifics. But uh, as I said, somewhat unprecedented, uh, for the governor himself to call all the superintendents together to deliver the message. Uh, his concern is that he believes, despite the work that the General Assembly did in cutting uh, 
uh, around $700 million from uh, the state's fiscal year 21 budget, uh, that there's another 500 to $700 million that will need to be cut. Uh, some of that will come from FY20 and some of that will come from FY21. Uh, I just received a word on Friday the 15th that our May formula payment was going to be reduced uh, because gaming funds are significantly below where they anticipated they, they would be and there is no general revenue to fill the gap. And so based on the change to the state adequacy target, uh, that calculation will result in uh, about $1.1 million in less state revenue this year um, for Francis Howell School District. Um, there may be additional uh, withholdings that impact that state funding uh, that the governor will give us specifics on uh, when next we have an opportunity to speak with him. So, and for next year, uh, the governor was uh, clear in my estimation that on July 1, he would begin to announce withholdings from next year's budget. Uh, I believe that the governor, uh, the, the General Assembly had counted on the possibility of there being some additional federal stimulus money provided to states to help fill budget gaps. And the governor said that in his discussions with the White House and with our congressional delegation, that the chances of that happening were 50-50 at best. And so the governor is concerned about the lack of an, any additional funding coming in. Also that because the economy is struggling right now, uh, there's an increase in the number of uh, people who qualify for Medicaid services, and that is something that the state has to fund. And so that's an additional uh, drag on the resources available to the state. Uh, so we will begin, we, we of course are incorporating this information into our budget and we'll share more details uh, when we have our opportunity to meet with you on June the 4th. Uh, but this is really pretty much hot off the press, uh, just coming to us on Wednesday morning. And I wanted to be able to provide uh, these updates uh, to the board. Again, I don't have a specific estimate of what will happen for next year's funding. Uh, I anticipate that uh, we'll get some additional clarification on that uh, coming up, but I will at least begin to think about uh, what the impact of that would be uh, as we move forward. And, whether or not we're able to completely reflect that in the budget that is presented to you for approval in June uh, remains to be seen. If there's no clear direction from the governor, um, uh, I would hate to speculate high or low. Um, it's, uh, I've, I've had a lot of experience of doing this, but my colleagues across the state share the same sentiment that none of us have dealt with exactly these circumstances and it becomes very difficult to try to predict exactly what will happen. So um, I, that, that's really what I wanted to share this evening. I'd be happy to answer questions that the board may have. Can I just clarify something that Mr. Supple said, and that is that the, um, the payment from May was adjusted prior to the governor having met with us to tell us about the additional withholding. So that is a separate budget issue that that it, uh, we didn't anticipate, but it is in addition to uh, what's going to be withheld from this fiscal year and from next next fiscal year to make up the gap in the state revenue. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Supple, thank you for the report. Um, you, you know, you talk about your experience and, and trying to do our best to estimate, you know, we're all in a brand new situation in our lifetime. We haven't experienced a pandemic. So, um, and it's unlike anything else. Um, so thank you. Board, any questions, comments? So. Ms. Walker. <clears throat> When this first started and we closed down schools and made decisions that we would pay staff all the way through, that was with Missouri telling us they were going to pay us. They're now saying that's not going to happen even for this fiscal year, correct? That's uh, correct. Me, well, let me jump in there. 
I think we anticipated they, I don't know that there was firm conversations and commitments to full payments from the state. I think we were hopeful. And I, I also believe that at the time, we believe that to be the best thing that we could do given the short notice, um, regardless of, of the payments from the state. So um, yes and no, Michelle, you know, I think that we believe that that was gonna happen, but we also asked the board to, to make that decision um, outside of knowing a firm commitment from the state. Board, any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay, um, Mr. Supple, thank you for that. Um, please keep us posted, you know, as it evolves. It's, a, it's an evolving situation. Um, with that, we do have a motion on the floor for to approve our monthly financial report for April 2020. Uh, motion by Mrs. Stiglage, second by Mrs. Walker. All of those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Supple. All right, next on our agenda, uh, we move into strategic planning. It's very difficult to do at this moment. Uh, board, I'll entertain a motion to approve the resolution temporarily suspending board policies that are in conflict with an executive order or federal legislation. So, so moved. Second. Motion made by Mr. Hain, second by Mrs. Lang. Mr. Supple? Hope oh, you're on mute, Mr. Supple. Um, oh, thank you. I guess the, the host was muting me. Okay, we got you. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Cope. Uh, uh, the Missouri School Boards Association sent out uh, some guidance that in order to uh, make sure that we aren't operating uh, uh, in, in uh, contrary to any of our policies, uh, that this resolution that would temporarily suspend policies that just only those that conflict with an executive order or with federal legislation uh, would give us uh, the freedom to act very quickly in response to, as you indicated just a few moments ago, is a constantly evolving situation. So uh, the resolution presented to you tonight was uh, uh, created by Missouri School Boards Association. And uh, our recommendation is that uh, you approve it in order to allow us to be as nimble as possible uh, as we continue to adjust to a changing situations. Thank you, Mr. Supple. Board, any questions, comments, concerns? No, very, very, very fluid situation. Thank you, Mr. Supple. All of those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Next on our agenda, um, board, I would entertain a motion to approve policy 1300 as revised. So moved. Second. Motion made by Mr. Lane, seconded by Mr. Lang. Um, board, as you know, we had a first and second reading. Any questions, comments, concerns? All of those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, uh, Mrs. Cope, I'm Mr. sorry, I, I didn't get to my microphone quickly enough. I believe the motion was put onto board docs before we added the regulation. And so the motion that you read was to approve policy 1300 as revised, but I believe both policy and regulation have been revised. So I don't know if you would want to take a motion to revise regulation 1300, or maybe the maker of the motion could revise their motion. I just wouldn't want there to be any confusion that we revised both, but didn't get approval for both. 
So the motion needs to be to approve policy and regulation 1300. Yes, ma'am. I would suggest I would suggest a separate motion so that you don't have to go back and undo that one. So maybe you would entertain a motion to approve regulation 1300 as revised. We can do that. Board, I'll entertain a motion to approve regulation 1300 as revised. So moved. Second. Motion made by Mrs. Walker, seconded by Mr. Lane. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Ms. Heidenreich, you've got the second motion that we added there then? Yes, ma'am. I've got that recorded. Okay, thank you. All right, next on our agenda is uh, the COVID-19 closure survey. Dr. Hoven. Thank you, Mrs. Cope and board. Uh, at one of our previous board meetings, you had asked us if we would do a survey and get some feedback on how our closure went. So tonight we're gonna present to you a couple of things. One is about uh, the feedback we re received on the closure, as well as we're gonna talk a little bit about next steps and where we're gonna go from here. So first thing I'm gonna do is give you an update on what the survey told us. Um, as you can see, we had over 2,000 responses on our survey. This slide shows the questions that we asked. Um, basically, can you give us a letter grade? Uh, what did we do well? What do you think we could improve on? What might we consider for any future closures? and any other comments you would like to share. So I uh, tried to keep it um, basic in terms of giving us some feedback on this current closure, knowing that we need to make some plans going into next school year. So again, over 2000 participants. Next slide, you can see where these group came from. Um, many of them were parents. Uh, employees also made up a, a chunk of those responses. We did have some in a dual role, parents and guardians. So you can see that distribution there. And then the, the first question, remember, was about a letter grade. You can see that about 85% of the responses gave us an A or a B overall on how we handle this closure. One of the themes that we saw, and, I, and I'll get to specific themes here in a second, but um, we certainly got the, the uh, responses from our community that everyone's showing a lot of grades at this time. You know, we were all thrust into this situation. Uh, many people doing many different things, everyone doing the best they could. And in our community, and these responses really showed that people understand um, that we were all doing our best to, to get through this situation together. And as far as themes that we saw on the survey, the question on what did we do well, uh, lots of communication, and that involves district level communication, um, you know, from Dr. Andrew Terrace, from central office, that includes things that our principals sent home, um, teachers to their individual classrooms, um, certainly lots of different modes of communication. There was a theme that people appreciated that. Um, online teaching, we, we have, um, you know, an awful lot of teachers in this district and, and we weren't, they hadn't been trained, we hadn't prepared for online teaching. So that was a, a, a quick uh, bit of flexibility from all of our staff and, and parents certainly appreciated their efforts. Uh, resources that we provided, you know, we provided uh, food for families that needed it, we provided computers and hotspots for internet, uh, printed packets for families who needed them, lots of different things as, as well as what we provided online. Um, just many different resources to help people uh, as they found themselves working with their kids. Can you go back a second? Uh, and our focus on safety, keeping in mind what's best for our kids and our families um, and, and helping people stay separated while we work through all of this. Things we could improve on, um, assignments, instruction structures, you know, going into a closure so quickly, we were aware that we have teachers using different platforms and some different ways to get things out to people. Uh, that was a conscious decision to continue to allow that um, because we wanted teachers to be able to use what they were most comfortable with uh, in terms of teaching their kids. So we know um, that it's not surprising here from some families that, that they would like to see some adjustments there. Uh, teacher email responsiveness, too much information and correspondence. That was actually something we, we did during the closure. We, we made some adjustments because uh, we were we were hearing some of this feedback along the way as well. So uh, many of our processes looked a little different towards the end of the closure than they did from the beginning. And then uh, some parents felt that they wanted to see their teachers uh, more face-to-face -face with their students. 
Uh, what we should consider for future closures, more interactive activities. So uh, lots of resources were provided, but many of those would have been students working individually on things at home with their families as opposed to interactive. So some had requested that. Uh, coordination and technology, we know that uh, through this closure, we provided one Chromebook per family that needed it, even if they had uh, multiple children. Um, I think many, many families underestimated um, just the need of devices, not just for their, their students and their learning, but that they as parents needed to be on their devices all day as well for their jobs. So certainly a different feel, even for families who might have thought they had enough technology when it started. And that's something we've heard as well. And other comments, there definitely was a theme of people um, very much thanking us for all of the time and effort that went into doing the best we could with this. So that's the results, uh, just a, a summary of the results from the survey. The next things we want to talk about is, is what else is going on to move us forward. Um, in addition to the survey, we formed focus groups. Academic team identified over 30 groups to try to get some very focused feedback from different groups. So uh, different groups of teachers, so representing all across the board, different levels, different areas, trying to get a lot of different teacher voices in that room, um, support staff voices in that room families, content leaders, administrators, students, looking at all the different ways, uh, not just wanting, you know, 10 people who represent the whole district, but really all these individual groups and we could really get some focus feedback. Um, and then some of those that didn't really lend themselves to focus groups, we also had some individual conversations with some families as well. And the point of these was to get a little more detail, a little more um, focused thoughts on uh, some of the same kinds of questions with a little more to it. Uh, so we asked about with our staff, you know, uh, and and with our families, what district provided resources did you use? How how well did it go with the online folders and the resources? Did you use them? Was that structure helpful? Did you, we, we talked a lot behind the scenes about what communication is best to come from the district and what should come straight from principals or teachers. And so we, we wanted to ask and get feedback there as well. What could we have communicated better? Um, again, what went well? Kind of like that last survey, what went well during the closure in terms of all of these things, resources, communication, and so on, what didn't go well, and what should we consider as we build plans over the summer? So next year, we know there's a possibility um, for disruptions again, even, even further closures, and so what kinds of things should we be thinking about? So the next slide covers some themes that we've seen so far from that. There are still some focus groups occurring, so this is, this is a so far themes. Um, felt well felt that we did well with supporting our buildings and teachers providing resources and again that's academic resources but it's also things like food and technology and all of that um, our content leaders and, and PLCs have offered a lot of support and as a district we've tried to provide support for those groups as well tried to be very um, outward in our family first message you know giving people options to um, find some some time to step away at times like when we move to a four-day week things like that to try to help people who are battling a lot of different things at home to, to take care of family as well as their academics things coming out of the focus groups we could improve on communication is one of those this is one of those that you sometimes see it in a what are we doing well and a what can we improve on we know that our internal communication um, was part of that feedback things things that we communicated out to our buildings and the timing of that and how well that went was was one of those messages um, grading uh, we we started with some views on grading and needed to come back and offer some clarifications and and still there was some confusion at times so certainly um, some improvements there uh, as I mentioned earlier we we made a conscious decision to let our staff use different platforms based on what they were currently using and and that's not feedback that's unexpected. We knew that that outwardly um, there might be a thirst in seeing more consistency, which uh, moving forward as we adopt Canvas as a district, things like that will be fixed uh, in, in next year if we have further closures. Uh, Performance-based classes, student technology needs. So we know these are all things that we were aware of along the way and doing the best we could. So um, we certainly don't disagree with some of the feedback we've received and there will be plans in place. So with that, I'm gonna move on to the next slide and talk about what are we going to do next. So the, these previous slides all talked about feedback we've received about this closure. So our next step is we have formed seven task forces. So we are now starting to move our thoughts towards what's August going to look like. Um, these groups have a district level leader, um, directors, chiefs, and, and so on are, are leading this task force work. 
they're going to pull in expertise. So you're going to have committees, task forces of 10 to 15 members, um, including teachers, administrators, support staff, parents, uh, to really try to get a robust set of expertise onto these uh, groups. Uh, you can see listed here what the task forces are in the area of instruction, health responses, human resources, facilities, technology, mental health, and logistics. And the idea of these is, is to identify some different scenarios under which we will be facing uh, reopening schools in August. Um, you know, in a, in a great scenario, we're opening as close to normal as possible. Um, in the worst case scenario, you, you open facing another closure. Um, and, and certainly in between are all the guidance we're hearing about social distancing and some of the uh, recommendations and, and um, considerations for us to make as a district as we reopen. Um, all of these things are difficult. You start talking about what it looks like to be socially dis distanced in a classroom. You talk about what it looks like to be socially distanced on a bus. You start talking about um, screenings for health on, on the way in the buildings and all kinds of different things out there. And so these groups are each going to give us the ability to have some really focused energy around these different topics. Um, in addition to the expertise on the groups, these groups are all reviewing the different resources that have been provided. Many people have seen the considerations from MSBA or the guidelines put out by the CDC, and there are many other examples of those. So, so the work of these groups is to keep in mind all of these different things as they brainstorm um, different possibilities. And really the goal here, um, working regionally, the entire St. Louis region and our county uh, is working towards looking at um, July to be able to make some more firm decisions. Right now, there are just too many, uh, too many questions, too many unknowns, and and waiting on um, developments that our health department will be able to give us guidance around. So these groups over the coming weeks are going to be um, running different scenarios and different brainstorming, um, and then by mid July, we're we're looking that some actual recommendations will come forward that we can start to put in place. And so that covers both the survey results and our next steps. So are there any questions I can speak to? Thank you, Dr. Hoven. Board, if you'll raise your hand if you have any questions. Mr. Lane? Dr. Hoven, I'm assuming that board members will be invited to serve on some of the task force. Yes, that is input, um, and we didn't have that on our slide, but we are certainly interested in, in, in the board's views as well. Thank you. Dr. Hogan, I had a question. Um, with our different task force, you had mentioned, you know, trying to work with the surrounding community in the St. Louis area to make some decisions by July, but our input on our task force, are we seeking input from other districts, not only locally, but maybe nationally, um, as we have this wonderful brainstorming opportunity in front of us, some school districts may come up with a golden nugget that our district has not. Um, what are we doing to make sure that we're gathering that information? Uh, so when I when you look at our task forces, um, we have many networks across the state and across the country from from people on our task forces and, and looking at that expertise. We know that some um, districts and some organizations have already put out some best practices that people have developed. So even districts we're not um, closely familiar with, we're seeing some of those things. Uh, we, we actually have a one central place that we're collecting a lot of the resources and guidance that people are coming across. So every time somebody sees an article or a publication from another group or research that's coming out, um, all of those we're collecting and, and making available to all of our task forces. And so um, it's really an overwhelming amount of information. It's, it's a good thing, um, but, but we are absolutely seeing examples of things that people are doing, um, looking at how those will, will best fit us and how they can be adjusted to fit our situation. Okay, great, thank you. Board, any other questions? I do have one. So communication was a theme on the stuff people liked and the stuff that they wanted, you know, both sides of it. Um, which one of the task force areas is going to be focused on communication? 
So we didn't have a task force with that specific folks in mind. The idea of the task forces was to wrap our minds around what are the health guidelines going to change about what school looks like. Um, we are always interested in how we can improve our communication. And so I would say it really um, goes across all of those areas. Um, no specific focus as a task force, but we do know um, that lessons learned and, and feedback received on what we should do differently about communication. But it's but that's one area that's not as tied to health department guidelines or anything like that. So that'll be something we uh, separately are working to to work on. Thank you. I just want to add to uh, Renee's question. Uh, Dr. Hoban and I have been in meetings weekly with the region. So we have a uh, pretty much a weekly meeting with the St. Charles superintendents. We have a meeting on Wednesday mornings with the entire region. So St. Louis County, St. Louis City, and uh, other other districts. And then pretty much weekly, weekly we are meeting with Dimitri from the health department. So I do feel like we have a good idea of what is going on. Um, and you know, I, I don't envy Dr. Hoban taking over at in this time because there isn't anything definitive from any of those groups or we would be communicating and moving plans forward right now. So we wait for that time when somebody's gonna come in and tell us this is what you're gonna be held to. And that has not happened as much as we, ha as much as we continue to push for it. So I know the board's getting questions from constituents about what's the plan for fall. And I, I don't know that we will be, I don't know that he will be able to share with you uh, any specific details about the restrictions or the plans until likely mid-July. Ms. Stiglitz? What I have been telling the people who've been asking me is that we could come up with a plan right now and it would be called Plan A, but uh, the reality is by the time we start school in August, we're gonna be on Plan M because things, it is a fluid situation. We've discussed that at many times and how things change every day and different things. So I don't think you're really gonna have anything in place at least mid-July before anyone even has an inkling of what this is gonna look like. I have another question. What about Vacation Station? How is Vacation Station working with social distancing and are we back with Vacation Station or not yet? How's that look? So we know, go ahead, Mary. Uh, one of the things when we brought staff back was we knew that we would need to provide some child care for our staff as, as we closed out the school year. So we are trying on a very small basis right now I, I believe it's eight students, um, what that could look like. So, you know, we're practicing and keeping an eye out for where the issues are going to be. And then June 1st, we will be opening vacation stations uh, with, with as much restriction as we can. Uh, Dr. Vanderpool has had up that charge and he is following the child care guidance from the CDC as opposed to the school guidance. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions, board? All right, thank you very much, Dr. Hoban. All right, next on our agenda is an update on Prop S informational update. Mr. Dykeman. Thank you, Mrs. Cope. Um, as you know, rescheduling the April municipal elections has created, uh, I almost said unprecedented there, but I know Mary hates that word, uh, unexpected challenge for school districts uh, with levies or bonds on the ballot. And Francis Howell, we were six months into our communications and community engagement efforts when everything came to a screeching halt. Of course, uh, all of our district work turned to alternative methods of instruction and student packets, Chromebooks, Wi-Fi hotspots, and food. Um, we restarted the Prop S informational campaign in April uh, with a careful reintroduction so as not to appear tone deaf to the current situation. Uh, that's why our, um, our new talking point is that while the pandemic has changed the district's short-term operations, it has not changed the district's long-term facility needs. Um, the Proposition S landing page on the district website is the go-to place for information uh, about the bond issue. Uh, all of our content has been updated with the new election date. Our communication plan includes a weekly Prop S story that's shared in district communications channels as well as in building e-news. Uh, this week, for example, was the FAQ. Uh, we also launched a new thought exchange this week. The question is, uh, what Prop S projects are you looking forward to the most? 
And if you haven't had a chance to, uh, to answer that yet, please feel free to participate. Um, we also have our weekly Prop S videos. To date, these have had more than 100,000 views on our district Facebook page. Uh, our, a few of them are new, like absentee voting, and next week will be safety. Of course, the S in Proposition S, uh, and a few are updates of earlier videos. Uh, we will have students, staff, and parents returning to our buildings this week and next week to pick up and drop off items. It's uh, one final opportunity for us to see many of them in person before the election. Uh, I've delivered Prop S yard signs to every building in the district, and we've provided updated flyers. Uh, we've also asked principals to record a short video for social media, uh, reminding parents what Prop S would do for their school specifically, and asking parents to vote on June 2nd. Earlier this week, every parent and staff member in the district received a letter from the superintendent with information about Prop S. Uh, and on Monday, we restarted our digital marketing campaign with DDI Media. Uh, you might recall these are the digital ads uh, that will pop up on apps and the websites of people who are in the district. It has been geofenced using our district boundaries. Uh, we also have hard copy and digital ads in local publications, including uh, Mid Rivers News Magazine, Community News. Uh, the Boone Country Connection, uh, and in fact, just today, the superintendent was interviewed by the Post-Dispatch, so you can look for that article next week. Um, next week, our hard copy newsletter, The Connection, will be delivered to every single household in the district, and it, of course, is chock full of Prop S information, and all registered voters in the district will be receiving a Prop S informational postcard in the mail next week as well. Uh, we'll have some please vote reminders on the Friday and Monday before the election, and building principals will be creating a school messenger, please vote a uh, phone call, email, text message reminder for Monday, June 1st. Uh, June 2nd is election day. And then of course on June 3rd, uh, we'll send out a thank you community message from Mary thanking our voters for passage of Proposition S. Thank you very much, Mr. Dykeman. Board, any questions? Mrs. Walker? I just wanted to say that that communication plan was fantastic. It was so thorough. Every single thing was hit. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. Uh, sometimes we don't get that level of detail and I just think it was really great. Thanks. Thank you. Board, any other questions? All right, thank you very much, Mr. Dykeman. All right, superintendent comments. Thank you. Uh, as the board knows, in March, Governor Parsons signed an executive order requiring all Missouri municipal elections scheduled for April 7th to be moved to June 2nd. This order includes our Prop S, as you just heard, the Francis Howell no tax rate increase bond issue, and the Francis Howell Board of Education candidate election. As a result of the COVID pandemic, the St. Charles County Election Authority is anticipating increased participation in absentee voting ahead of the June 2nd election. The election authority has been working very hard to provide disinfectant wipes, masks and gloves for election judges and hand sanitizer for voters for that June 2nd election. To improve social distancing, judges tables and voting booths will be moved farther apart on election day. Voters are encouraged to wear face masks while, they're, while, uh, while in their polling places and voters will be asked to observe appropriate spacing while in line when they vote. The 2020 U.S. News & World Report Best High School Rankings include all three Francis Howell High Schools on that prestigious list. The ranking evaluated almost 600 public high schools in Missouri and reviewed more than 24,000 nationwide. Francis Howell High School, Francis Howell Central, and Francis Howell North are all in the top 30 in Missouri and were ranked in the top 3,000 high schools across the nation. Francis Hall High School is ranked number 12, Central number 23, Francis Hall North 29, all in the top 5% of our state. Uh, during the March board meeting, we had the pleasure of recognizing, did I lose you? Of recognizing Emily Hood, who was named the 2020 Journalism Education Associate Student Journalism of the Year for Missouri. And since our last meeting, Francis Hall North, the uh, Francis Hall North executive producer, was also recognized across the country as the 2020 National High School Student Journalist of the Year. Congratulations to Emily on this well-deserved national recognition. She's amazing, she's an amazing young lady. Uh, two high schools in the district uh, are able to announce that they have 
uh, two students with perfect scores of 36 on the ACT, junior Natalie Althoff of France Hall High School and senior Eric Piesel of France Hall Central both achieved that score. And finally, while our last day of school was this week, it wasn't at school. And I want to acknowledge our amazing teachers, our adaptable students, our hardworking support staff, creative and creative administrators for the incredible job of teaching and learning that happened under these circumstances. Uh, it's, you've heard me say, in a crisis, France Hall comes together, and this was no exception. Our staff, our students, our community have once again proven how much heart they have when it comes to meeting the needs of our students. So I, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank everyone for everything that they have done in the last six weeks. Here, here. Thank you. All right, board, now it's our turn. Uh, any Board of Education comments or requests? I think we're good there, okay. Uh, if we can take a look at our upcoming meetings, let's first look at our June 4th meeting. Uh, that meeting will be in the boardroom is the plan. Any additions, corrections, changes? I have a question. So right now we're still under the order of groups of no more than 10, correct? I thought Missouri was groups of 10. Dr. Mary Hendricks, I you're on mute if you were talking toggling back and forth between board docs and that. Mm -hmm. uh, the groups of 10 is for social gatherings, and so this is not considered a social gathering. We, we would be allowed. In addition, any of those capacity numbers that are being thrown out there do not directly apply to us. While we might be using some as some guidelines here and there, the schools are, are not, there aren't any specific restrictions to schools at this point. So um, between it not being a social gathering as well as um, not applying to schools there we are able to have a board meeting and you know I think if you look across uh, across the cities around us they are starting to bring back their live meetings as well and I, I know we are anticipating holding um, some live graduations at the family arena in July so thankfully the rule of 10 rule is not applying to us at this point yeah and I and I'll just add, there will be modifications to the board meeting and the board room um, for social distancing. Okay. Anything else on our June 4th meeting? Everyone looks good. Okay. Uh, can we take a look at our June 18th meeting? Any additions, corrections, information at that for this meeting? Mr. Lane? Renee, will there be an opportunity, it may not be an agenda item for us to speak about where we're at as far as the opening of school, or will that just be included? As we get updates from the state and the federal, local, or would that not be an agenda item? That would be something that would be discussed by the superintendent at that time, during her, her time. I, I think uh, regardless of whether it's an agenda item or or if we address it in superintendent comments, uh, Dr. Hoban and I are happy to provide an update to the board monthly at, at every meeting at this point. I, I think that we might not have any information, but we'll report what, that we have no information if we don't, so. Thank you. All right, any other questions around the June 18th meeting? Okay, thank you. All right, with that, board I'll entertain, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn our meeting. I'll move. Second. Motion made by Mrs. Lang, seconded by Mrs. Walker. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And I have lost connection. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can oh. hear you. Can you yes. see me? Yes. Yes, yes. 
<laughs> Interesting. I see no one. With that, we're adjourned. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, everybody. Stay safe, Bye. stay well. Good night. Good night.